eat endangered animals and help save the planet. We visit a British wildlife park with an unusual approach to rare species. Even though there are CITES animals, we should be able to still cull them in good management process, as long as it's done right um, and educate people lovely meat it is. Inquisitive deer stalker Tom Davis and I try out a variety of whistles and calls on the row to see what attracts them and what scares them. Tropical Storm. News editor Ben O'Rourke looks at the increasingly crazy situation for elephants and rhinos in Africa. We have news, we have hunting YouTube, we have a £625 form rifle stock to give away. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. this a template for the future of our deer parks? No, it's not very British. <laughs> Lots of deer and antelope from all over the world. Out with the traditional monoculture, in with multicultural modern thinking. Rather than have, you know, a thousand of one species, red, fallow, whatever it might be, as long as you have the right uh, ratio of male and females, you can have all these species together. Our trip to Watatunga Game Reserve in Norfolk was originally planned to test the quality of the IRA thermal range. We all know what a fallow looks like through a thermal, but can you identify a bongo at 120 metres? Bless fuck. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you right? Can we put some money on this? No! <laughs> <laughs> the hat I'm absolutely loving. I'm a, I'm a big fan of pith helmets in general. And yeah, this. Yeah, you didn't seem that surprised when I mentioned. That. <laughs> so, yeah, shall I bring one of my own? <laughs> <laughs> this this one coming from you. This this will have a special place in my collection. <laughs> What we also discover is an incredible conservation programme with honest, transparent management. CITES species burger, anyone? Would you like your steak rare or just endangered? I'm passionate about food and it's important to know that all these, are, whether a browser and the grazer, you know, they all eat differently as well. And so we get this into the restaurants, into the mainstream, and that will allow the public to help in the conservation effort as well. So we could have a hog deer burger? Absolutely, yeah, definitely. The hog deer breed really, really well, actually. They're, they're hard to transition into a new park, but once they've uh, acclimatised, they do really, really well, a bit like Munchak. And again, in the zoo side, they've got these species that where they don't want to shoot them because they think it's conservation, but actually, if we use it as a meat, if you look at the Pear David, for instance, you know, Woven have about five or 600 Pear David, and they cull 200 a year. So there's no problem with culling a conservation species. It's actually better for the species, as you know, good management, really, to allow the females to keep uh, breeding. The man behind Watatunga is Edward Pope. Just two years ago this rich pasture was full of onions and sugar beet. Now it's full of endangered species and a wealth of domestic wildlife flourishing in a low predator environment. Yeah literally the fence went up two years ago. What do your um, fellow farmers so. say when you told them you're going to do this? Um, they're really inspired by it actually. They, they think it's an amazing thing um, and it's not that we've given up farming the rest of the farm. We're actually you know, farming that in a, in a more sustainable way. We're using drone technology and satellite technology, using a lot less chemicals and farming what we have um, well and, and sustainably and then turning places like this back to nature but not just UK nature. We're you know, working with um, stud books all over the world to uh, help populations stop them going extinct, really. Satisfying job. Yeah, amazing, yeah. It's, every day is different. <laughs> well, when you work with animals, it, it really is. <laughs> There's a definite Jurassic Park feel from the electric interactive buggies to the safari lodges to some serious fences. So these buggies are all GPS controlled. They have the flat screen in them. Um, and as we drive around the reserve, they can give information on the screen and um, we'll stop people going off the beaten track so if someone tries to drive this buggy into a lake it'll stop the buggy and shut it down because it knows where it is within the reserve. Ed and his management team use thermal a lot. They have a thermal drone which tech mad Ed is more than happy to demo. Get this beast up in the air. quality of these thermals has just increased so much. 
that we're now able to do a, some very good identification with the thermal. And that for me is, is so important. We have to dart a few of these animals. Sometimes they're very quiet at night and the best time is to do it in the dark. So with the thermal scopes, you know, we want to know that that dart is going to fly true and, and hit the target. Um, and we want to know that we're darting exactly the right animal and we just want to make sure we're picking out the right one. Or if there's some grass in the way, a lot of thermals in the past couldn't identify the, the grass. They, they just picked up the heat signature of the animal because if a dart hits the grass, it probably sets it off and, or you know, can ricochet uh, in the wrong direction. So for us here, you know, in this conservation project, having these, these machines is, is absolutely vital. So how are our intrepid pith helmet wearing safari friends doing with spotting those species? Just to mention, they do actually know there are two large water buffalo cows behind them. Not kingfisher, is it? Definitely not a kingfisher. <laughs> Obviously, is this one of the busters? <laughs> who, who are you out of this combo? Is it like when it ain't our hot month? <laughs> the comedy, the comedy for lines thrown in them to join me. This is like my one liner that's all I got. <laughs> Ryan has brought all the IRA kit for the Watatunga team to try today, including a product new to the UK that we're seeing exclusively for the first time. Hi, Mr. Charlton. <laughs> morning. Yeah, fantastic. Quite a spectacular place. It's, it's Norfolk's answer to Jurassic Park, I think. <laughs> we should be comparing your ability to spot and, and identify compared to Paul with the binos, but to be honest, these have been very obvious, haven't they? <laughs> so we've got a few of them. We've, we've been quite lucky so far. I think we've, we've all spotted more with the naked eye than with binos or with, uh, with thermals, but it's, it's been a fascinating experiment so far, hasn't it? Yeah. What surprised you about the thermal? I mean, you're looking at animals you'd never ever look at at home. It's, I mean, little things like when the bongo were walking by and we could see the stripes on their coat and the, the white spot on the, on the face of the male. And the level of detail is, is incredible. But also, as we've been driving through, when we've been able to spot the seeker hiding in the woods. It seems to me that everyone's got their. They're worth using this as a tool, haven't they? It, it's great. I mean, even, you know, you've, you've got guys like this, you've got dairy farmers who observe their herd and are looking for inflammation of joints and that guides and steers their antibiotic use. And you've got everything from that to installation inspections to, you know, applications within the field and the field sports community as well. And it just shows how this sort of technology, now that it's become more widely available, how useful it actually is. Is there any particular one of the, the IRO products you've been particularly enjoying using today? So this one, this is, uh, this is an exclusive actually. So this is the only one in the country at the minute. This is the E6 Plus Spotter, the V3, so the, the third version. The most impressive thing is it's got an OLED Super HD display on there. So the level of detail that we're getting, you know, when we're saying we're seeing the the stripes on the coats of the bongo and we're seeing the white spot on its face we're seeing that and, and recording it so this this thing i've i've been using this thing now for three four weeks it's astounded us every time we've been out with it it's really 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 cool what is refreshing about the conservation work being done here is the rounded thinking they look after the little things so the big keystone species like tigers have a fighting chance so these are hog deer and uh, there are less of these in the wild than there are tigers, but they are tiger food as well. So if we don't look after these uh, little animals, then our whole ecosystems can be lost. To most people in zoos and safari parks, they're little brown deer. So they don't have that sort of wow factor, sexy species that tigers and, and other animals get. And yet they're so vitally important if we're not careful, this will be another species that uh, become extinct and no one will have ever come across them or know about them. Save the tiger is sexy conservation and attracts cash. Save the hog deer to help save the tiger doesn't grab the headlines quite as much, but it needs to. And with education, that's part of the messaging Watatunga is trying to deliver. At the moment we've got 22 deer species here and we could do a lot more as long as we have you know, the, the sort of deer parks within the UK taking on some of our surplus animals. Um, and that's the same in zoos as well. There's a lot of surplus in zoos where zoos need to, they have the manpower to concentrate on more endangered and, and animals that need more time spent. Whereas the, you know, the axis deer and the more common species, there's more barasinga now, but again, in the wild, they're very low numbers. They could go into deer parks. 
um, great venison. We need to still cull them uh, and market them, be able to market them as a venison. Um, even though they're ascites animals, we should be able to still cull them in good management process as long as it's done right um, and educate people lovely meat it is and then the numbers will grow. And these deer parks can take, you know, big numbers. We could have two, three hundred Barasinga, you know, in one deer park, which would be fantastic. Paul has known deer manager turned antelope wrangler Julian for years and as much as he loves the deer and antelope, Mr Childerley would happily visit here for the bird life. I see deer every day, so you know, it's like, I've seen it before, but you come out, there's oyster catchers on the, on the side, they come running down, nobody else notices them apart from me, but you know, yeah, it's, it all sort of knits well together and the smaller things sometimes get forgotten, yeah, especially the bird life, that's for me, that's, that's the main thing. Have you seen a busted before? No. It's strange looking things, aren't they? Yeah, aren't they great? <laughs> just, just cannon fodder for foxes, aren't they, really? I mean, that's one of the biggest bonuses, isn't it? I mean, they've done a lot of fox control here, but otherwise it wouldn't work, would it? Yeah, fox control and spending a lot of money on and, and policing the fences around the outside, digging the fences in, tall fences, overhangs, electric on both sides. I mean, you know, they've gone to a lot of effort to keep things alive, really. So, yeah, take my hat off to them. What a hat it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a hat. <laughs> this is a hat. <laughs> You've been very accommodating today, thank you very much. No, pleasure, pleasure. Watatunga is a fabulous place to visit for a day's safari or for a longer break. And for this year in particular, it's the perfect staycation safari for anyone missing the veldt or savannah. Of course, it does not offer canned hunting or indeed any hunting. Instead, it promotes sensible management designed to benefit species that need benefiting. To find out more, go to watatunga.co.uk and for the IRA range, go to irauk.co.uk or check out Ryan's reviews on our Field Tester YouTube channel. Thanks all who took part in that film, especially Jack Pike for the pith helmets. And if you want a first look at that IRA E6 Plus V3.0 thermal monocular, there's a link to Ryan's Field Tester film in the description below. Now from hot-blooded to reptile, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. More than 2,000 school children experienced the British Uplands last week with hashtag Let's Learn More. Gamekeepers, farmers, fire services, police, mountain rescue, conservation organisations and national park authorities ensured thousands of primary school children had a day to remember and learned about the management of England's delicate and important moors. And moorland groups continued the education at the Great Yorkshire Show with reenactment of a driven grouse drive for visitors to take part. The House of Lords is giving the House of Commons a hard time over its animal sentience bill. The bill aimed to create an animal sentience committee which may feed into a new rural police force, the planned Office for Environmental Protection. Organisations including Basque and the Angling Trust are concerned that animal rights extremists will weaponise these government structures in order to end shooting, fishing and livestock ownership. Work is ongoing for the second day of the debate which is yet to be scheduled. Kenya's Wildlife Authority says it doesn't know anything about plans to fly elephants out there from a Kent Zoo. The Aspinall Foundation announced plans to send 13 elephants from Howlett's Wild Animal Park to Africa and has been raising money online to pay for it, reaching more than a quarter of a million pounds so far. Damien Aspinall insists donors will be part of conservation history. He says one of the reasons they're being sent to Africa is elephants don't breed well in captivity even though all but one of them is born in Britain. Kenya's Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife tweeted a statement saying it knew nothing of the plan. The Prime Minister's wife, Carrie Johnson, who is communications chief for the Aspinall Foundation, said it would be the first ever operation to rewild a herd of elephants. Kenya's statement said moving elephants around is not easy and is an expensive affair. The plan needs approval from the Kenyan government, which it doesn't have. The Charity Commission is investigating the Foundation and Howlett's over possible conflicts of interest and misuse of charitable resources. After a flying start, the Just Giving page raising money for the plan has not had any donations since Monday. 
Meanwhile, animal rights activists are calling for a ban on keeping elephants in captivity in the UK. The Born Free Foundation says there are 51 elephants in zoos and they have no educational value because they're living out of the context of their natural environment and suffering a range of psychological and physical ailments. The elephant welfare group set up by the British and Irish associations of zoos and aquariums has been working on a report on the issue for 10 years. Chester Zoo's Director of Animals and Plants, Mike Jordan, says zoos play a vital role in conservation and developing a vaccine for a type of herpes virus that affects elephants. The British Pest Control Association is holding a members summit on general licences for bird control in Northern Ireland. This comes after the Northern Ireland Environment Agency announced a consultation on wild bird control following wildly unpopular licensing changes across parts of the UK. The BPCA summit on the 6th of August will gather views of members who operate under general licences and submit a response on their behalf. The NIEA consultation focuses on the proposed removal of herring gull, lesser black-backed gull, great black-backed gull and rook from all three categories of general licence. If you want to attend, register at the link in the description below. A zoo described as Britain's worst has been denied a licence to keep animals. Borth Wild Animal Kingdom experienced a string of incidents including escapes and animal deaths. The attraction, north of Aberystwyth, was banned from keeping big cats last summer. Owners Tracy and Dean Tweedy's company, which changed its name to Animalarium, wound up in court in February for debts of more than £100,000. Two months later, they applied for a dangerous wild animal licence, which was denied after an inspection in May. On Field Sports News, the zoo owners threatened to slaughter their animals if they couldn't continue. An amnesty for handing in newly prohibited guns ends at midnight on the 14th of July. The Offensive Weapons Act 2019 prohibits possession of self-unloading rifles other than in 2-2 calibre. Most firearms affected are manually activated release system and lever released rifles. The National Rifle Association of the UK reminds owners of Mars or LR rifle they should take it to the nearest police station or face a five-year jail term. The Home Office says 1,133 rifles have been surrendered, but the NRA is convinced that a handful have not. Apple has taken a popular and legal gun seller's app off its app store. Apple removed Gun Broker, which is also a website, because it regards apps that facilitate the purchase of firearms as objectionable content. The tech giant insists the move was to protect the safety of its customers, accusing Gun Broker of wanting to shock and offend people. Apple's rival Google also removed the app from its Play service because it violates its dangerous products policy, though it's left car buying apps on the platform. The Minnesota Deer Hunters Association wants deer farms closed down. The hunters are worried about the spread of chronic wasting disease from the farms to wild deer and are calling on the state to buy out the herds, then ban farming. The hunters also want the transport of deer banned except those going directly to slaughter. This comes after authorities killed dozens of deer on farms with the disease, which is similar to mad cow disease. It hasn't been proven that it can pass to humans. The local legislator adjourned this month without addressing the issue. The grouse population of a US state is on the decline because of the lack of muirburn. Wisconsin's Department of Natural Resources says hunters won't be able to shoot sharp-tailed grouse in the state for the third year in a row. A spokeswoman for the department says she blames a lack of prescribed burning and timber harvesting of the barrens, grasslands and forests where the grouse live. She says private landowners shy away from the costly land management needed for the bird's survival. Almost 100 vultures have been found dead or dying in a suspected mass poisoning in Spain. Carcasses of 55 vultures and a black kite died after eating the remains of four sheep in a field in the northwestern region of Castilla y Leon. Authorities are investigating whether they were poisoned on purpose or if they ingested agricultural chemicals such as sheep dip via dead sheep. And finally, a tourist caught a man throttling a gull after it stole his donut. Cornwall Live website insists people on the Torquay waterfront were horrified by the incident, though most walking past appear amused or not bothered. The camera woman says the man bought donuts, put them on the rock while answering his phone, and the birds swooped in. 
He grabbed one by the throat. It dropped the sugary snack, which the man carried on eating. He then threw the bird over the ledge as if to say, Donut, do that again. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Still in the stories, fishing for facts. Now, it's the game fair next week from the 23rd to the 25th of July at Ragley Hall in Warwickshire, and I will be running the Carter Jonas Game Fair Theatre. It's a three day chat show with me being a kind of rural Graham Norton, and my lineup includes Country People's Peer Lord Botham, Phil Spencer, and Adam Henson from Off the Telly, and the Shadow Defra Minister Daniel Zeichner, who will be there to explain how the Labour Party intends to win back the countryside vote. And if you want to come along to the theatre and sign up for membership, we will have goodie boxes to hand out at the event. Plus, you can enter a special Game Fair draw for a knife. Dean Smallwood of ADG Custom Knives has made a new design just for us called the Field Sporter. It's a handy short bladed knife for everyday use from cutting baler twine to gutting rabbits and fish. These pictures show the processes he went through building it and one lucky new member will win it the week after the game fair. All you have to do is sign up at the game fair. Thanks Dean, a fabulous £200 prize. Now, staying on our safari theme, I went out with deer stalker Tom Davis ahead of the row rut to see what calls work on row. If you want to see deer, start early. That's what Dartmoor deer stalker Tom Davis does, and this time with a musical mission in mind. We've got dog toys, we've got fox calls, we've got uh, a flute, <laughs> we've got blades of grass. Um, yeah, so we'll see how we get on. Um, not worried I don't shoot anything this morning, it's just a bit of fun so we can call something out. So, you know, days that I'm not with clients, I'm out scanning, searching the valleys um, and locating them. It's, yeah, it's part of the job which some don't see, but um, yeah, you've really got to locate them. So when it comes to actually taking someone out or going for yourself, you, you know exactly where they are and uh, you can go for them. Um, so last night I was out, I spotted four uh, Robux. This is all local to home. And hopefully we can uh, get a bit of footage from them calling in this morning, which would be great if we can. But uh, like I say, they're not rutting yet. It's um, you know, about two weeks early. It's not long before Tom picks up an animal in the thermal spotter. Uh, yeah, we just, not far, just where the head is. Uh, the ball. <laughs> we'll go for the ball. I had a little practice this last night to try and master it. It's worth saying what we're trying to imitate, and here opinion is divided. The feep feep sound could be a roe doe or it could be a roe kid in distress. Here's one we found earlier. Back at our row, Tom spots the animal reacting to the sound of the dog toy. After calling, I got a glimpse of one shot through the gate gateway, then never saw it again. And just we come in this corner, there's one stood there. We go through the gateway and there's our row, a doe. It's time to try another call. I step up to blow a blade of grass pinched between my thumbs. Oh, it likes that. Then we start to get a profound reaction, both to the grass and to the dog toy, with the dog toy definitely ahead on points. <laughs> it runs off and then runs back.
Um, it brought uh, the dough in. Um, it, well, I think it, it worked straight away, but um, as we went around the corner, we bumped her and she ran up into the field behind. Um, then we went back to her and yeah, she came in really well to the call. Um, the butt wasn't there, but what we did notice was when I scanned from the other side of the valley, there was something in the hay here and that was behind us. Um, we never saw it, so I'm presuming it was the kids, the fawns laid up there and that's why she's so well, upset and angry and <laughs> emotional right now um, but we pulled away we didn't want to stress her out too much um, but yeah it worked which is great better than my blade of grass uh, uh, yeah uh, well no comment <laughs> yeah no I mean the, the grass sounds great actually I think it's a better tone than the oh, ball did you, uh, did you yeah I did when when we found the right blade of grass <laughs> it worked <laughs> it could have been the kid that kept her coming back maybe that was a case of Calm down, dear. Next, we come across a pair of ears in a field, and Tom gives them the dog toy again. Eventually, that one gets bored of us and bounds off. I mean, when she got up, I'd done the ball again and she stopped, but I think we both agreed if we, even if we just shouted, she would have stopped. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I would have said it was just, yeah, that was more out of interest, but what, what it was, that wasn't, yeah, it wasn't the call. It wasn't the ball at all. We haven't tried just standing and swearing at them, have we? No, we, we, maybe we should do that. Yeah, they don't like our singing. <laughs> our last pair of row calls prove we are not so much here to shoot row as entertain them. First up is Tom's fox call. A pair of row kids watch him, mesmerised. I think the call would be more effective if we went laughing when we were trying to do it. <laughs> the two kids join their mum on the other side of the field. It's good to see them. It gives Tom useful information, not just what's coming on locally, but what he is likely to see next year. And just to prove that this is a serious scientific experiment, here is the full orchestra. <laughs> I, I can tell you've been practicing this. <laughs> I know how to single lesson. <laughs> Now, Clay Sports TV was at the Worlds this weekend at EJ Churchill, and that film is out. Here's what to expect. If you thought the football on Sunday night was exciting, you should have been at West Wickham. Mark Windsor took the World English Sporting Championship in a dramatic six-way shoot-off that went right down to the wire, with everything hanging on the very last shot. It was the culmination of a week-long festival of shooting at the EJ Churchill ground in Buckinghamshire. There is a link to watch that in the description below. Now, we're off to Africa. There's an easy way to make sure there are plenty of rhinos, but the anti-hunters in Europe and America would rather see these wonderful animals wiped out. Ben O'Rourke talks to some of the stakeholders to find out what the easy way is. Poaching has become more intense and deadly. 
In the last 18 months, with the eyes of the world's media on domestic issues, poachers in Africa have developed horrifying new methods. As long as the market is there, there will be poaching. And what is happening now already is, is that guys hunt these, these uh, rhino with, with high caliber uh, guns. But they are now starting to poison water with a, with a poison which we call two-step. It comes from that if, if a dog gets in as much as a match head of that poison, it takes two steps and dies. So now they poison water holes and animals die there. Uh, and specifically where rhino and elephant go to drink so that they then have access to the horn and they have access to the, to the ivory. If an animal grows an ivory tusk or a horn on the end of its nose, there are criminal gangs that want it dead. Poachers are killing unprotected rhinos wherever they find them. The problem makes headline news all over the world. Well-meaning pundits offer solutions, yet rhino species everywhere are in terminal decline. If trade was legalised, if we could meet or try and meet the demand from China, there's a good chance this animal would still be walking here today. Correct. Very good chance. I would be able to afford the kind of security and fencing and stuff that would keep would have kept them out and she would have been alive. Solutions to poaching of rhinos and elephants touted by governments and Western animal rights groups, such as burning confiscated ivory, are short-sighted, say wildlife managers. When they first started burning ivory, Richard Leakey and I shared a public platform in Johannesburg. I think it was 1993. And I said to him, whoa, you've just burnt a lot of ivory in Kenya. Now, how can you justify burning ivory when we are on our hands and knees to the people in the West and saying to them, please, Africa needs donations. He said that the Americans said to him, we want you to burn it. If you can make a big spectacle, where you can burn this ivory, then the whole world be in, will, will be incentivized to, to back CITES when it says that they're going to ban the ivory trade and the elephant will be declared an endangered species. I know the Kenyans have been bought into doing such silly things. You know that they are 100% funded from outside by animal rights groups, their parks and wildlife management authority. So that's how they do it to you. They frustrate you to the extent that you can't use your resources, then they start telling you we can burn them and then we pay you money. And in burning that, they will go back to their European constituents saying, we have achieved uh, to stop trade in rhino horn and in ivory, it's victory, can you donate money? So they're getting a lot of money out of it, more than they will even compensate Africans for doing that. So it's an anti-use agenda and we'll never accept it in Africa. The problem is in the regulation of rhino horn and elephant ivory. The prohibition on rhino horn makes it reputably more valuable than gold. And just like whiskey in 1930s Chicago, the only people making money out of it are the criminals. Who the poachers are in Africa? And it's not the poor little village hunter. I'll tell you it's not, it's the politicians. Whatever the syndicates are doing with the rhino horn, whether they're stockpiling it or whether they're selling it. The route apparently now is through Taiwan. doesn't matter. The point is there's a market. Now, you live next to the Kruger National Park in Mozambique on the eastern border of Kruger National Park. Eight years ago, all the villagers there, the houses were out of, made out of reeds, the roofs were out of reeds, the lot. Now, if you take an aerial photo of those villages, all the houses are built out of bricks. They all got zinc roofs and there are trucks standing outside the houses. And that's not because all of a sudden they've got more crops to sell or more cattle to sell. It comes from the poaching of rhino inside the Kruger National Park. You must understand that, that being caught is one thing. You, you, if they catch you and they put you in jail, you sit there for 18 months and then you get out. Wildlife managers say what African countries should do with the rhino horn and ivory trade is what America did to the trade in alcohol. Don't ban it, regulate it. Allow the trade under strict rules and earn tax dollars from it. Despite what CITES says, elephants are far from endangered in many parts of southern Africa. Selling their ivory could produce much needed money for conservation and development. Because we are being told we cannot sell ivory 
to make money to pay for the culling they have to do to manage the elephants, to get them the population reduced to the size that it should be. We say, well, can't, we've got all these stockpiles. The Zimbabwe stockpile of ivory is huge. The house that I live in here, it would fill it twice over to the ceiling, every room in the house with tusks. Huge, huge amounts. They're not being killed. They've been, they've been sitting, that ivory's been sitting there for years. They're not allowed to sell it because CITES says that every time they issue a permit to any sovereign state to sell a small group of ivory, of ivory tusks, there is a spike. There's a spike in the ivory poaching. At the same time, rhinos can be farmed and their horns harvested since those horns grow back. Africans use their resources. They never burn them to be paid for destroying them. That is against the values of uh, sustainable use. Uh, as we are saying that even with the rhino horn, you know, you can use it sustainably. The legal position of rhino horn is the subject of battles between different jurisdictions. CITES allows trade in horn from rhinos kept in reservations. South Africa banned the trade in rhino horn in 2009. The country's constitutional court recently backed domestic trade. And now South African politicians may be about to bring in new rules restricting it again. Meanwhile, rhinos are becoming fewer all the time. Southern white rhino numbers in Kruger, South Africa's biggest park, are down to a few thousand. The government says it doesn't have an exact number. Poachers are encroaching on private land, home to 70% of the white rhinos left. If governments in the West allowed horn harvesting, this would not be happening. Their reason seems cosmetic. When the tourists come, they want to see the rhino with his horn in Kruger. So if, if the horn is not there, it's, not, it's like they're not seeing the right rhino. But if, if the tourists were educated to say that the rhino is now going to be seen with a shorter chunk of its horn because we're harvesting, uh, then they would understand and appreciate that. Is the problem is that we inherited the same colonial way of doing things uh, to say wildlife is just for scientific management. We cannot start having someone who is in charge of running a marketing uh, department to sell the horn. Which the people buy in China or in the Eastern countries. It's, it's, it's really got nothing to do with how you and I think about that. It's how those people that use it think about it. And for us to say that they're wrong, come on, Ben. Then, then we must say the Pope is wrong. Uh, I, I mean, who are we to say that they're wrong? Uh, th then the Pope must be wrong, and, and then Islam must be wrong, and, and, and Buddhism must be wrong. Uh, so it's very, very relative. And it seems to me as if people are not prepared to understand that that the value judgment about these things sitting in America and in Europe is not the world's value judgment. The absolute majority of people sit in the East of the world. And we should actually be living according to their value and not the European value. When Elliot Ness and his team of untouchables busted a whiskey shipment, Al Capone simply made more whiskey. It's not the same with rhinos. They don't grow like barley. Without a sensible new system to harvest rhino horns, their future looks bleak. Thanks to the Field Sports Nation for stumping up for that piece. And their award in this week's Field Sports Extra, their exclusive show out on Tuesdays, is the chance to win a form rifle stock worth £625. Form starts to make a stock by talking to the shooter. Their staff get the rifle shooter's individual perspective on the stocks they own and how form can make them better. They compile a list of needs, ideal shooter specifications, dimensions and profile preferences then use a CAD program to draw these design criteria in a 2D, then 3D profile. Form uses a six-axis CNC machine to cut laminate hardwood timber. The result is a fit that will improve your shooting. Winner can choose from a rifle stock, air rifle stock, Marlin Rhino or AR grip. And you can have a look at what form stocks are like on our Field Tester channel. Link in the description below. Now from rifle stocks to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube.
This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. No such thing as a free breakfast, says David from Predator Protection UK. This film follows two videos he made last week clearing up the stranglers. Thanks to Duane from the Wash Wildfowlers Field Sports Channel for sending me this film, Farmyard Corvid Shooting, some good high flighting. Derbyshire Countryman puts up a montage of pest control, including corvids, ferals and fox shooting. Thanks, Tim. Lanx Vermin Control is out after grey squirrels with his air arms S. 510 he's given them a break so there are plenty to shoot this morning and the film has good commentary. Thijs van Leeuwen sends me this from the German equivalent of Basque. It's in German and highlights the importance of predator control to help ground nesting birds. A message it's good to see rolling out all over Europe. Mark Heath from the Gunbook Social Network did a live stream with the Air Gun Gurus Facebook group on YouTube and kindly mentions us. It's a useful chat podcast channel for air gunners. If you are interested in our rhino story this week you might like this suggested by by my tiger expert friend Rajiv Matthew. Gayinda, a conservation story, documents the life of the greater one-horned Indian rhinoceroses of Kazaranga National Park in India. It's 15 minutes in English. And finally, thanks to everyone who recommends A Letter to Chris Packham, put up by the National Gamekeepers Organisation. It's by a Yorkshire keeper and from the heart. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and best of all, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about the show Field Sports Britain, which is out 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>